Alright, now hold on. Yeah, I know, this is not exactly what I usually go over, considering this basically amounts to Hunger Games of zombies or whatever, but there's a variant in here that's pretty cool. So anyone who clicks off now loses the title of Big Guy. In the future, which is now the past because we have all aged, the human race would be besieged by infected. These infected are quite unlike any other that we have discussed before. Unlike those of other infections where the brain is largely destroyed and only through neural plasticity would some functionality be gained, these infected seem quite different. Able to think, possess internal dialogue, and understand the world around them to a degree, they would live out their lives just infected. However, those who had their infection progress over a longer period of time would become something known as bonies. So the question becomes, how exactly are these people infected if they can think? What's the deal with eating brains and getting their memories? What causes them to progress into the late stages of infection where all humanity is lost? And why would I even choose this movie out of all the other ones? Well, let's discuss that in today's episode. Oh, and I guess uh, how love saves everyone, I mean, uh, okay, it could be interesting. But first, this episode is sponsored by Upside. Upside is a cashback app that enables you to get more value from your purchases and improves profitability of local businesses. They partner with 30,000 businesses and 25,000 gas stations across 48 states. So how does it work? Well, you open up the app and claim whatever offer you like, whether that be food, gas, or groceries. Then you go ahead and head there and check in at the business through the app and choose which card you'll be using. Or upload a receipt pick later and then pay as usual. So for example, gas is expensive. Well, you can get up to 15 cents cheaper using the app, and I actually found it 20 cents cheaper on a recent trip. Which, considering it was a forerunner and I was driving hundreds of miles, that ends up adding up. How this whole process works is predicated on people showing up to these individual businesses in order to purchase something. So you really don't have to pay in or use any special points that are only usable at upside, and there's no limit on how you can actually earn. Then the businesses get your business, and everybody wins. So this is actual money going back to you, and you can withdraw it at any point, and then put it back into your account. And even then, if you don't want that, you can cash it out on gift cards too. And if you share Upside with friends today, you can increase your own earnings. So if all that sounds good to you, then heading the link in my description, you too can start earning money back today because gas has just gone completely insane. So we kick off our story with this being Lionsgate, and if the past holds true, that means Lasso Entertainment will copyright this and it'll turn into a whole giant struggle for who's actually breaking the law. Spoiler alert, it's not me. We meet our main character having internal dialogue about how he can't connect with any of the people. Being in an airport, we see that they are are all infected. He doesn't remember his name or his parents or his job. Large portions of his brain have been subdued or appear to not be functioning at all. As he walks through, he begins naming off traits that he's attributed to others. He doesn't remember how the outbreak began, but then again, it really doesn't matter. We also get commentary on uh-oh society with people on their phones. You know, pretty much the standard. As he walks through, in the darker areas of the airport exist the bonies. These creatures were infected humans that have gone completely feral with their outside to match. Looking like the feeders from Dead Space 3, their nose is still very much so work as they can smell moving blood within the non-infected and have become extremely aggressive when going after prey. They typically will not mess with other infected but will behave more strongly if they are in the way. How you become a bony is supposedly once you lose all hope you begin peeling off all of your skin and then eating yourself until you are left with this wendigo looking appearance. As R heads back to the plane his dexterity skills seem actually pretty good. He's been collecting random things within said airplane including music which can't be played or I'll be copyrighted into oblivion. But this does suggest something interesting. R apparently does have a friend at the airport who will grunt as they almost appear to talk until finally they actually do utter a few single words, which again is interesting concerning the actual diseases we have seen. But because of this one utterance, they head off into the city to find some brains. Meanwhile, in said city, a group of uninfected have set up and are sending out raiding parties. We get some exposition about how it's been eight years since the infection broke out. As they make their way outside, things have calmed down quite a bit in those last eight years, but that doesn't mean there still aren't bonies around hunting and eating people that they can find. As a smaller group moves through, they smell regular humans and then enter the building. At that time, the uninfected group is inside discussing whether or not they should just bolt out of there after hearing a noise, but Mr. Leader Extraordinaire, also known as Perry, also known as Brain Soup, in about two minutes, tells everyone, no guys, it's absolutely okay, we need to stay here, as there's no way we couldn't like, you know, come back tomorrow or anything, really, when potentially the immediate danger that we find ourselves in now has passed. See, this is why I wouldn't make a great leader during a zombie apocalypse. Also probably because I'd be getting infected day one. Anyhow, they should have listened because the other group now arrives here's Johnny style. The infected group bursts through the door and just starts wrecking face of everyone in there. Julie attempts to hold them off along with the rest of the group. By the way, Julie's the blonde, but Perry gets grabbed and dragged to the floor with his brains being eaten by R. This gives R a Jimmy Neutron brain blast as he absorbs Perry's memory like some sort of sponge which causes him to see Julie. Upon seeing her, like I guess through Perry's memories, Lady in Red starts playing in the background as he goes 
goes up to her, except Lady Red doesn't really start playing. It just kind of fits here. He puts his blood on her to cover up her scent as the rest of the group moves in as he escorts her out of there and back to the airport. Back in the plane, she curls up in the corner as he walks back with a snow globe and sets it down. He sits in another seat and tells her that he won't eat her, but she's not feeling it, Mr. Krabs. So he walks off of the plane and out into the shambling horde, locking her in. Or I guess locking her in. Really, he just shut the door. He ends up going out to a car and eating more of Perry's brains to lock in the memories. It's basically Julie, Perry, and her old man having dinner. Julie starts bashing her father for wanting to build a giant concrete wall to keep out the infected. Like, okay, that's actually a pretty good idea. But we get the montage of the only way out of the city, which will be important later, as you know. And after their romp, though they only brought like handheld force multipliers, like maybe bring a little more than that, they find out that Perry's dad has been infected, which made R aware of why Julie may be so scared of him. Returning back to the plane, she has her force enhancer raised as he gives her a blanket and then we get your standard love story. Like, why did you save me, super bro? Because he was thinking with his second brain. Perry's brain to be exact. You thought it was something else, didn't you? So he plays some music and then zones out as one does. Couldn't say I would zone out to this music. Uh, you can't hear it, but just trust me on this one. Not great. But as it plays, his heart beats once, indicating that the tissue must be at least somewhat alive. The next morning, he didn't sleep because he's infected. He just really stares at her. She tells him to let her go as he says it's really not safe out there. She needs to eat, so he has to go get some food. You know, actually, zombie life isn't much different from married life. The going out and getting the food part, not the holding her against her will part. Anyways, before I get put on a list, she does the smart thing. Like, I'm not even actually bashing her at this point. I would have run away too. So she runs away. However, it's an open tarmac, so the infected are everywhere. As she bolts, she gets surrounded, as they can just completely smell her, so it's kind of a futile thing to run, I suppose. But R shows up and covers her in the dookie blood once again to hide her scent. And like, quick question, is anybody else getting Twilight vibes from this? So R teaches her how to walk past the infected, although it looks ridiculous, but it does work. And she's able to find fruit salad and eat, along with a single beer, which is a Corona. Oh god. Yeah, any port in a storm, I suppose. So they elect to call him R, by the way, since Prometheus can't really remember his name. And the talks about her getting out of there start up again. Also, you think this filming was like awkward? Like he has to stutter and anyways. Julie asks if there are others like him, which he doesn't really know. So, okay, check it out. They get in a car, which by the way, uh, just so you know, gas goes bad after like six months, even with a fuel stabilizer, you really only have about a year and maybe some change. So after eight years, that gas would be straight varnish and the car wouldn't even really start. But anyway, back to my previous complaining. But you may notice something here. The whole concept is they'll notice she's gone. Like, why does that matter? But yet they're driving a car at the airport. Like, bro, just keep driving. Head to the woods and just walk off. Well, we can't have that, can we? So R tries driving. Obviously, there are some issues, you know, lack of fine motor skills. And this results in him wrecking the car. Back on the plane, they continue to listen to music and bond as one does. She really seems to be over her boyfriend getting eaten like super quickly. But what you may find interesting by playing music that long and going through things like slapping hands, it causes the brain to actually fire more aggressively, which may be important. In fact, a case could be made that this is some form of stimulating neuroplasticity, sort of in line with what we may do with somebody who has traumatic brain injuries or TBIs. Obviously, this isn't the only thing that's done for TBIs, but pretty much anything to stimulate the brain is important. Later that night, our heads to the front of the plane to eat more of Perry's brains. It's Perry signing up for the armed guard area as he has a flashback of when he actually got his brains eaten, which makes R upsetty as he spits out the brains as they now apparently taste bad, I suppose. Also, Julie apparently made a run for it in the middle of the night and got surrounded. R is able to fend off the other zombies before his friend confronts him angrily. R declines as the bonies then show up because they also smell Julie, and luckily for her, it just sort of stands there and growls and then slowly walks up. So they make a break for it to get out of there. However, the bony is now mega angry at him as three others corner them, but his friend arrives and oh, by the way, his name is M. So M then hits them with the luggage cart and takes them away. M asks R if he's okay as they just got cornered by another group of zombies, which uh, they hold hands. And with the power of love, they're able to pass. Corny? Yes. Dumb? Yes. Dead inside? Absolutely. So the group moves out of the way as she gets into the BMW, which I'm surprised can even run on regular gas, as then the bonies move in and give chase. But they get out of there, driving in the rain in a convertible, which indicates there was no blockage for her to go through if she just wanted to keep driving earlier. They could have, she could have just taken the, okay, anyways, doesn't matter. But I guess they didn't realize that there was like a roof for the BMW. I mean, it's a convertible. It should be a cloth roof. Anyways, heading to the last neighborhood her dad evacuated, they go inside and stop for the remainder of the night, though it looks kind of like early morning. Luckily, there's a lantern with matches right there, and she finds a camera and takes a picture of him, which, I mean, she doesn't know. That could have made the dude go like ape mode or something. So she goes up to sleep and then asks if he wants to lay on the floor as one does. 
Back at the airport, things are not cool kosher. As M looks at a reflection, he sees hand holding, which makes him remember things of his own past. Another walks up and remembers his original life as well, as M talks to him, and the group all has their hearts beat occasionally, but that attracts the bonies, who can smell it as they approach. You see, they don't believe in the power of love, because they're big nerds who live in the basement of the airport and talk about how nobody likes nice skeletons anymore. And they also finish last. But at the neighborhood, a search party then goes through and does an absolutely horrible job at searching for Julie, as she then strips, which again, this is for teenagers, so that's like the pinnacle for them. And I say that having once, I know, been a teenager myself. She asks R if he has to like eat people or will expire, and he confirms that yes, people taste pretty good. She tells him that he's a good person after having known him for like four days, which he then confirms that he actually ate Perry's brains, which she suspected but didn't want to believe, which she bonded with him while knowing this? Like, dang, pretty ice cold. So she rolls over and gives him the cold shoulder as he sort of lays there and goes to sleep. So he has his first dream, which is hilarious because it's like the group picking on him except for Julie. I mean, Perry probably deserved to have his brains eaten if this is how he acts, but this is just a change fundamentally in the operation of his brain. He wakes up the next morning and then runs outside because Julie went missing, so he's on his own once more. And now you know this part of the movie where there's like a separation and blah 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 story arc, so R gets in his own head about it, which you never want to do. Always remember to gas yourself up after something bad happens. And finally, the BMW does what BMWs do, which is break down as she's forced to walk to the giant walled off city. You see, the walls represent safety, but also separation. The power of love. Anyway, so she gets tested for infection, passes, and then talks to her old man. As he asks if she's sure that she wasn't bitten, and without checking, he could just kind of like, okay, sure, yeah, whatever. I'll take your word for it, and they all head back inside. So then R does the classic thing and walks in the rain and is cold. And as he does, M shows up with a squad and yells out to him. As they talk, R is turning back into a human. M tells R that the bonies are looking for him and her. Apparently, he started something as M also saw a dream last night, which means his brain is changing as well. The power of love! So he asks the rest of the group to help him find Julie as the group agrees. The slow shamble now begins that would likely take at least a month at this pace. Using Perry's brains and subsequent memories, he's able to traverse the same area from earlier when they escape the city to look for Perry's dad. See, told you it'd be important later. He backtracks to the uninfected city as he still clearly kind of walks infected, but seeing his reflection, the coloring of his skin is starting to come back. Approaching this giant manor with every light on in the house, with a strained electric grid and resources likely running low, I can only imagine, Julie is talking to her friend Nora. They have a very teenage conversation about dating zombies, maybe I'm just getting old, but the cringe factor appeared off the charts. But as they wrap up their conversation, Julie goes outside onto the balcony and spots R below, real Romeo and Juliet style. Wait a minute, R and Julie. Bro, it is Romeo and Juliet. I literally just connected that. Anyway, so Nora yells at, <laughs> like, how did I not get that? Okay, it doesn't matter, moving on. So Nora then yells at Julie that she's trying to sleep, which how can she hear her through those thick walls? That's beyond me. But Nora then comes out and spots her boy Romeo down there and they let him in. Bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see how it plays out. So they hug it out and he now feels warmer than normal as his metabolism has probably started back up as well, hence being cold in the rain. Nora asks him a ton of questions, which is basically what I would do as well, because you need to learn about the disease. You have someone here who has firsthand knowledge, so why not ask him? R talks about how the rest of them are starting to dream again and change. So they like totally give him a makeover so they can move him through the city without him getting got. Oh, also the bonies are still on the trail, but considering the giant walled off city, I mean, that should work in theory. So they begin moving him through the city and then go to talk to Julie's dad. Apparently the city is on high alert for one reason or another, but apparently it's classified. They're mobilizing and luckily the dad expositions the hell out of us. Reports are coming in from scouts that large packs of skeletons and bonies are coming in for an attack. Julie tries to tell her dad that they are curing themselves and her dad is just completely based and then just walks off as R goes up to talk to him. The dad doesn't know who he is, so he questions him, which he automatically knows that he's infected. I don't really understand this part. How would you come to that conclusion? He can talk. At this point, Nora pulls a force multiplier on the dad to stop him. I don't think she would actually pop lead in him, but now the alarm is sounded as R and Julie take off. Moving into what I can only assume is like a tunnel system, they then backtrack out of the city, but are stopped by the large group of infected that had followed R. They aren't mega infected anymore and have now retrieved a large portion of their brains to fight the bonies, or really fight against. Julie and R take off as they begin fighting amongst each other. A few give chase but are dispatched as soldiers then begin moving into the area to get it all under control. As the bonies begin their attack and eating soldiers, one soldier in particular can't get his rifle unjammed as another infected helps him, which solidifies there are differences in the infected. Also considering the bonies are being ultra losers to any infected as well, I mean, hey, basically like in Halo when the elites and brutes start fighting and you just sort of walk through. But M shows the soldier which ones to take out, 
which makes things a little easier. Also, what in the world? As our Julie burst out of a door, it's like a door to nowhere. Our grabs Julie as they jump into the water as his body acts as a cushion to soften the blow. Julie gets him out of the water as he's hilarious, like he's he's almost human, but he's instantly shot in the chest. I feel like there could be an issue since he's turning human again, or at least full human. So his eyes go back to normal when he takes the hit as the old man just isn't having it. So it becomes a plea for sanity as R starts bleeding, which makes him be like, uh, oh yeah, he's alive. He's just completely destroyed his aorta from that round in his chest, but yeah, he'll be fine. Anyway, so the colonel gets on his radio saying that the situation has changed, which I can only think there's like one dude fighting for his life against something, hearing the situation has changed and never really getting clarification on it. It now becomes soldier and infected, or at least lesser infected that is, moving through, taking out the bonies. The infected learn to live once more, sort of, with the key to their cure, just living your life. With the past. Is that joke getting old yet? Probably. So the world is exhumed as all the infected hearts started back up and everyone finds a counterpart. Now, this would likely kick off a whole host of socio-political issues like are humans humans and zombies zombies? Do we treat them the same? Can they survive more dangerous environments? You know, the same kind of issue that when machines achieve AI, if we really don't treat them correctly, we're just gonna get stomped out. The standard stuff. So it ends with the wall being torn down, which the whole world hasn't been fixed yet. There's still plenty of infected out there who haven't changed. Uh, and what about raiders? I don't know, man. You already had it. Was there a need to tear down your walls? Probably not. So let's start with common knowledge. I think we all know at this point, as stated in the movie several times throughout, the infection was viral in nature, which will be important later to discuss how it was able to sidestep the human immune system as innate immunity should have already formed a response to the invader once the person was bitten. Which is rather interesting considering we don't see too much swelling when we get there either, but there likely is still some to see. This will also help us to understand the spreading of black blood vessels that we see branching through the body underneath the skin, as well as the overall coloring and tone of the blood itself. The virus vector, however, has not been discussed anywhere in the movie. Whether it was a bunch of rabid monkeys, a cloud being dropped on them, or something else, it remains to be seen because after a person is bitten, their memory appears to be wiped out completely. Even after they come to, there is no discussion about how this whole thing was kicked off from those who are uninfected to those who have been changed. But what we do have are two classes of infected, which as time progresses, so too will the effects of this infection. These infected are considered undead, but really because they can be cured of the infection or at least have their body be able to subdue it to the point that it's possible for them to become human again, this would indicate that it's an infection as once you actually literally bite the dust, that's it. There's no coming back. Now, the heart does stop, which means clinically they are dead. And there needs to be a method because the heart has stopped in order to keep the cells alive, even in an environment when they aren't supposed to be alive, which we'll get to that. There's actually a lot to get to in this one. At first, the infection presents itself in the only manner we know, host bite. Once a person is bitten, the exact time to become a zombie isn't really discussed. However, the bite ensures the person will change regardless of intervention by medical staff, which gives us a huge clue as to what's happening internally in the body. This clue to the infection will spread from the bite area using the circulatory system as the main mode of transportation. From here, it's not clear how fast that it enters the cells of the body, but it is clear that the nervous system is likely the main target. Much like rabies, it will begin attacking the nervous system, but not in a way to destroy it, but to subdue it to a large degree. After infecting the nervous system, this may be more easily accomplished because of the fragile nature of the nervous system in general. See, the nervous system tissue is something of an immune privileged area. Now, not too long ago, it was assumed that all nervous system tissue was free of the immune system due to how it could damage the tissue, leading to massive issues for the host survival. The reality is a little different as usual, and we have come to find that out the last few years. The immune system does regularly patrol areas around the nervous system and in the nervous system with even things like the central nervous system, such as the brain. However, the methods by which the immune system can counter a pathogen has been largely neutered and for good reason. You would not want a natural killer T cell going all out in the brain for a simple infection somewhere else. And because of this, the immune system developed a way of almost wearing kid gloves, really for lack of a better term, when dealing with the nervous system that may be compromised or have an infection nearby. Because of this more gentle approach when dealing with infections that may be affecting the nervous tissue, this creates another issue. It allows for a pathogen to more easily spread, even more so if it's using the actual neuron as its target cell for infection. Basically think of it as the immune system working at 20% strength when dealing with sensitive tissue. However, I also believe it to be more than just this because after all, the virus is able to make it to the nervous tissue and actually continue the infection process. And for it to do that, it must exist within the bloodstream for a time. Once moving to the heart, it would immediately be drawn past the cardiac tissue to the critical area that actually controls the heartbeat, the electrical system of the actual heart itself. The sinoatrial node or SA node, which is the pacemaker of the heart, would be infected. Now it should be noted that the SA node is 
still considered muscle cell, but it does produce electrical impulses. Once the SA node is subdued, all heart function would cease and electrical pathway, it would be basically interrupted. However, it should be noted that the heart is not damaged during this process, which you may be asking, how is that possible? Well, I believe it comes down to how the virus not only interacts with the nervous system, but interacts with cells in general. It's clear that when the virus first infects a person, it spreads rapidly. Now, it clearly wouldn't just beeline for the SA node, as it really wouldn't have any idea what an SA node is because it doesn't have thought. Instead, it would infect cells along the way, producing more of itself as most viruses do, which includes in the cardiac tissue itself, until reaching deep within the heart and getting to the pacemaker cells there. By the time it does this, the infection has likely spread to almost every other cell in the body, or at least enough to potentially preserve the cell or preserve the body. It's clear some of these neurons at the peripheral nervous system are not infected yet by possible chance, given the infected an unnatural gait and lack of fine motor skills over their muscles. The same could be said for the muscles actually themselves. Perhaps there just isn't enough time to infect every single cell possible, but it's clear that one area is greatly affected, and that would be the brain. Once the heart is shut off and the body is infected, the brain is likely completely inundated with the virus. And believe it or not, this is a good thing because if you had to be infected, I believe the virus changes the actual functioning of the cell, so you would want it to definitely infect your brain. It's clear the virus slows things down, and this concludes like things with aging, which means that the metabolism of the self itself would need to be slowed down. And this would be critical because with slower cells comes less of an issue of needing nutrients and also less issue with waste removal. And this could be accomplished when the virus enters the cell. All functionality within the cell is altered at this point by utilizing DNA of the cell that would result in this process. But how exactly? Well, it's clear that this is likely a DNA virus. This means that it would implant into the cell and then be transcribed into the actual genes of those infected. From here, it may produce protein structures that either get in the way of or takes out a protein catalyst within a cell designed to speed up chemical reactions. By doing this, less of this enzyme is available and because of this, the entire metabolism slows down. Now, you would still need to survive, so it can't just cease all functionality of the cell in general because they do still move, but the metabolism of the cell itself slows. Sort of like when you have a frog that freezes during the winter, the metabolism of the cell doesn't completely stop, but it definitely slows down to the point that they are in cryostasis. But you still absolutely need oxygen, but the only thing I can imagine with this virus is that because we need oxygen to survive, it would fundamentally have to alter the way in which a cell exists, and that may cause it to sport more of an anaerobic metabolism, which is way less efficient than an aerobic one, but I suggest this because they still need to eat and are still hungry, and if they don't eat, they'll actually turn into late-stage infected, where clearly their body starts eating itself. So moving on. As this process continues, this will result in an infected person with a flatline heart whose metabolism has been heavily altered by the virus, with it being slower than average, likely way slower, and potentially shifted to an anaerobic metabolism, seeing as not much oxygen is going to be moving around the body without a functional circulatory system. This slowdown in cell function has also resulted in the brain slowing down as well, which is to be expected. It's clear the infected mind is one that is operationally still human, but with slower firing patterns or potentially the altered functionality of the neuron itself, this has resulted in a few issues. The first is memory acquisitions. The infected cannot remember anything about themselves prior to the infection. Now, typically memories are stored in the belt, the hippocampus, but memory actually isn't all that difficult for your brain to remember typically. In the order of three to eight times per second of an electrical current, it'll cycle and that'll help you to retrieve memories. For something like sensory information, this would be 30 or more cycles per second. But I imagine this is where the issue lies. Because of the slowdown or alteration of the neural tissue, the functioning of the hippocampus would be severely altered, stopping or interrupting at random points this three to eight cycles per second. Because of this, memory can never be retrieved from your previous life and only new memories of your infected life are actually stored. And this may mean the hippocampus is working as when R remembers his friend M, but in a much more altered state. That also raises the question if the brain returns to a normal functioning functionality, would he still remember his infected life? And there's potentially the possibility that he may not. The second phase or late stage of this infection is one that is more complete and what we would think about with your standard infected that supports a few ideas mentioned about some of the cells not having been infected yet. When a person apparently loses all hope considering their brain is still functional to a degree, they will become a bony. These creatures have completely lost their skin and pulled it away, revealing the desiccated muscle underneath as it has been exposed to the environment and now in no way is as effective at moisture retention as the skin layer is. Judging by what we see on R, the skin to a large degree may not have been infected as deeply as the rest of the body. This has resulted in his own skin becoming ashen and gray as the skin being one of the fastest dividing cells because the cell cycle is short.
shorter means that the virus itself may become more broken over time or cells that weren't infected are dividing and then likely meeting their end much earlier because those cells are dividing quicker. This results in a virus implanted into the DNA exercising less and less control over the ones that it did infect, becoming more fragmented during mitosis, which results in the skin actually meeting its end because it may not remain anaerobic, but return back to its normal metabolism. This means that for all of them, the clock is ticking and ultimately should enough time pass, they will all become bonies regardless if they give up or not. Although picking at the skin does make the process accelerate. So you may have noticed that the muscle itself is gray in color as well, instead of the deep red coloring that we would expect. And this is indicative of what's happening in the blood. As the muscle is infected and the heart is eventually stopped, all the red blood cells could potentially undergo the same process as the rest of the cells. This is why when the heart is able to start back up, they don't just immediately uh, drop dead. But due to the stagnation, this leads to the plasma to begin dehydrating over time. This in turn will cause the blood to appear a brownish color as the plasma itself loses water. And this results in the black veins that we see underneath the skin that seem to progress the longer the body has been infected. It should also be known that without the constant beating and mixing of the heart, the components of the blood may naturally separate over time. However, again, the cells inside, if altered by the virus on a metabolic level, would still be somewhat viable. This then will sit in the muscles, causing them to appear much more brown to gray with more dehydration, leading to almost a complete dehydration of the plasma, leading to the outer muscle to likely meet its literal end and become something of a new skin. Apart from that, though, we do see some other differences between the ones who have flesh still and the bonies. The bonies are absolutely vicious. They can smell moving blood rather than just the generalized scent of a human like the fleshbound ones can and they can also move quicker. And this could be due to the overall lost weight on their frames by skin falling off, taking any fat that it had with it and some of the muscle. Because of this, they appear to literally be nothing but bone and a light covering of muscle. That has clearly affected their strength as Julie is able to hold one off from attacking her but this has made them much faster and more agile, able to jump on soldiers and bite them quickly to begin eating. Their brains would be in also a more subdued state with likely damage having occurred in areas such as the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus in general as they don't appear to remember much about their infected life. It's probable that this is due to time and really just not giving up. The brain, even in a subdued state, would not have access to energy levels that the rest of the body may have and as a result, this would cause damage to mount over time, which plays into why R may actually have been different from the rest. While different from the rest, however, it appears he does still fall in the same category as everyone else who's infected. He still needs to eat in order to maintain his nutrition levels. Energy output requires energy input. Upon eating brains, it is said that he can see the memories of those that he eats. And it may be possible that with the virus having such influence over the neurological tissue in his own head, that when eating another brain, the virus infects the tissue that he's actually eating, and this causes it to fire electrically upon doing so. The virus itself would be in mass levels in the saliva, considering the bites are effective, so that would make sense. Once the tissue is infected, considering the proximity to where our brain is in our own skull, there may be a bleed over effect activating neurons to fire in a similar method due to the viral integration. But again, I think we all know this part is a little strange as there's no direct link. However, I guess you could make a case that the same nerves that give you brain freeze may be the bridge that causes the firing pattern to allow him to see memories as it runs up to his brain and again causes the nerves to fire in a similar pattern in his own brain when he's eating brains that he's currently infecting. Yeah, it's it's quite the, uh, it's quite the process. But it's clear there is a period where your brain still functions actually rather well. People all over the airport would continue to do what they did in their non-infected life quite regularly, such as scanning people, ordering drinks from a bar, like M does when he goes to close his own tab to go get food with R, or flagging down planes for them to land. This is the critical period of the brain. Should you act out these with no new challenging information for your brain to undergo pushing for neuroplasticity, your brain will continue to degrade until you basically become a bony. But with R listening to music, collecting things, and experiencing new events, his brain, every once in a while, would reconnect with the rest of his nervous system, likely with a single big push of electrical communication. And this is all based on neurochemicals, likely coming out in enough force to push the electrical communication, which then would bleed over into the brainstem, which runs down to the spinal cord and would communicate to the heart to increase rate, which allowed it to pump one time. And this would move nutrients to other parts of the brain, which may have helped long term. Now, this wouldn't be enough at the end of the day to like save himself, but it may have preserved his brain for longer. And with the interaction he had with M, this may have helped him as well. The bonies, on the other hand, were those who basically had no new experiences or enough time had passed for them to basically end up like this. Instead, they wandered around and their brain continued to sit and starve in their skulls until eventually they wouldn't know who they were, where they were, or what was happening, resulting in them just sitting down. Of 
portions of the brain would continue to devolve and degrade until it resulted in more animalistic instincts taking over along with self-mutilation. However, that's not to say they were not intelligent. A case could be made that the bonies actually enforce somewhat of a hierarchy, screeching at the infected, who they know are like them, but also aren't. And considering the irregular infected look away somewhat fearfully, this means that potentially there are attacks from bonies on regular infected. And this is shown to be the case when the bonies literally begin hunting down R after he inadvertently triggers a mass change to Team Human towards the end of the movie. Which, speaking of, how does this happen? Well, it's all dependent on the brain itself. Once you become a bony, there is no going back due to the actual brain damage that has been incurred. Much like if your brain gets eaten, you don't arise to join the horde later, you're just meat. This means that the brain is critical for the actual infected to move around, and because it's critical, this means the brain itself plays a huge part in how the disease was overcome, and this once again is reliant on the heart-brain connection. I had mentioned previously about this connection not too long ago, but with R experiencing what he has, every once in a while this causes his heart to beat once. Along with the others who experience a strong enough feeling, this causes their hearts to beat, and once it beats once, this triggers a process based on the immune system itself, which, for us to understand, we must learn about how diseases actually sidestep the human immune system. When you are first infected, skin cells, and this is this is basically like any infection, like there's an abrasion, you have an infection. Skin cells will yell for help, which will result in inflammation and the flooding in of innate immune cells, such as white blood cells. However, they will not find what they are looking for if you are infected with this specific virus. When an innate immune cell goes to basically read what's human and what's not, it will typically do so by using toll-like receptors. These receptors, upon finding something it does not recognize, will then activate, which basically will tell it to immediately destroy what it sees. But this is how the virus insidiously infiltrates the body. Much like how the herpes virus can cause Kaposi's sarcoma, this tricks the toll receptors into leaving the virus alone, and so too this may exist in the warm bodies virus. Oh, and if you don't know what that is, basically it's a gamma herpes virus that can actually cause quite a few forms of cancer. But what's even more fun is your body can really never get rid of it. Hmm, what fun? Aren't viruses a blast? But these two viruses operate in a similar fashion in that they prevent the activation of the toll-like receptors, meaning the innate immune system won't actually know to attack this virus. Then as it continues to spread more deeply, likely something would happen that results in a possible counter. You see, basically all of life is randomized to a degree. And somehow, somewhere, with some possibility, one virus would be destroyed and brought to the B cells for interpretation. At random, the B cell would have the right pieces to make the antibodies for the virus, and typically this would then spread and destroy the virus because of the propagation of that specific B cell. However, the virus does something the body can't anticipate. It literally shuts down the delivery method of which it would combat this virus, the heart and subsequently the circulatory system. With this shut down, the antibodies are just sitting there, unable to counter the virus in any major capacity, but ready. Every time ours heart beats, a little bit of those antibodies get released into the surrounding area to destroy any viruses it can find. The cure is within the body like with most infections, but it just can't go anywhere that it needs to go. This means that possibly if you perform CPR on a zombie, it might actually work to cure them. Anyhow, as the heart beats a few more times, this continues to deliver these antibodies. Then more allows the T cells to begin actively looking for nearby cells as they can move through the circulatory system. Then in turn, this results in the body beginning to self-clear from the virus as it has the capability to do so. It just didn't have the method of transportation to do it. Over time, this would clear more and more of the virus in R's body, allowing the body to be cleared more quickly. But you still do have the issue with the actual infection in the cells in critical areas such as the SA node. But it's also possible that given the time frame in which this virus has been out and the fact that this hasn't happened before, this may indicate that there may be a certain point in which the virus does go dormant within the body, allowing the cells to return to somewhat functionality, coinciding with the immune system clearing out specifically the circulatory system. But once this line is crossed, it can never go back because hypothetically, if it's implanted into the DNA of a person, it will permanently try to release the virus. But because the body now basically has a way to destroy the virus over time, it would be kept at low enough levels as not to inspire the same bloodlust and aggression that it did earlier, allowing for the body to return to a normal operating status. And this is why towards the end, when they're all co-mingling, M remarks that he still has zombie fingers even after the fact, because in some ways, his body is still suffering from the effects of the virus, or potentially this is leftover damage that he may never recover from, but his immune system can now keep it in check long term, allowing for them to not ever be able to be infected again by any other infected, but still also control themselves when it comes to humans.
But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, then leaving a like would be greatly appreciated as YouTube is an algorithm-driven thing, so liking gets it out there. And subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on when I post. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, Twitch, and Roanoke Games streaming links in the description for anybody interested in that. And speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our two astronauts, Jonathan and Wesley A. Weaver Jr. Thank you, guys. I'd also like to thank our astrophysicist, Des Dancer, as well as our scientist, Countryside Limbo. And to the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping everything running and is greatly appreciated. Appreciate it. All right, so that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and we'll see y'all in the next one.